Well, Bob, thank you so much for meeting with us. No, your son was me. your son was so kind and talked to us, and we're just delighted to have the chance to sit down and talk. What we want to talk about today is the early history of the Silver Sides when it when it was still in Chicago, and how you have helped to manage to get it over well, there. Well, Silver Sides was actually the third third pick. Okay, what were the other two? Uh, the law, the destroyer law, uh, was in Muskegon and made a cruise, summer cruise. Oh, really? And during that time, I, uh, I asked, I don't know, I was, uh, I was with the captain, and I said, what's going to happen to the ship when the cruise is done? He says, going into retirement. So I put in a bid to get it to Muskegon, and it was pretty well taken. But the Navy decided they weren't going to give it up at the very end. So they gave me the uh, heavy cruiser. Um, oh, what front was it? But anyway, we had, it was 800 and some feet. Oh. It had a 60-foot turret taken out of this. Out of the center. <laughs> it was just a money hole. We decided we couldn't afford it. So. Then I got a phone call from Chicago saying that Chicago, the silver size had been evicted from Chicago. So I thought, boy, that's more in our liking. That's more than what we know. That's what we can afford. And so I uh, immediately called the Navy. And I did have some friends in the Navy. And uh, they uh, told me, yes, it was available. But, of course, I got into politics. It took almost two years to, to get this. Finally, one day, I got a phone call saying that uh, the Silver Sides was leaving. It was evicted. And um, uh, it was, I put in, I went to Washington. I flew to Washington, made an application, and it was accepted. And uh, there was a guy named Dick Freitag. Nick and I, and Dick was against it at the beginning with, but he came in our corner at the end. Dick and, was uh, against it because he wanted it to remain in Chicago, or? Well, yeah, he wanted, everybody wanted to remain in Chicago, but they had so many problems. There was, uh, unfortunately, there was, it was a money game for several people. It wasn't being, you know, it wasn't being, uh, the dues weren't going where they should, and, and uh, it was kind of a, so we put in for it and got it, and uh, I'll never forget, um, I think it was Monday, I had already been awarded the silver size, it was Lee Friday, and I was asked by one of the, one of the naysayers, uh, when are you going to get the silver size, Bob? I said, Friday. And they look at me and I said, well, I don't tell you what Friday, but it would be a good day to get the ship. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they laughed on Wednesday. I got the Navy, I went and asked the Navy, I said, they wanted Chicago to make the announcement. And I said, okay, I said, we'll, but Friday we'll figure out a well, Thursday night's paper. Um, I forget the name, guy's name, who promised me that I gave him the story to Muskegon. Promised me he wouldn't print it, but he did. And so, but it didn't matter. It came on Friday, so yeah. I went over there. I rode the tug back. I didn't write, nobody was allowed on the server side, but we left Chicago about, oh, I'd say about 1 o'clock, and I in Muskegon about 11 o'clock at night. So he towed it across that night. Fine. Okay. And, you know, one of your friends, Tom Keenan, who's been visiting you, I believe. Oh, Tom Keenan was, I'll tell you, you can't ask for a better backer than Tom Keenan yeah. was. Yeah. He yeah. was just a tremendous person behind all this. Okay. Uh, can, I, can I take a step back? Can you tell me a little bit about um, Dan Rostenkowski? Do you remember him from Chicago? I'm sorry? Dan Rostenkowski. He was one of the aldermen that really wanted to keep the silver sides in Chicago, and he was a Muskegon native. That Dan Rostenkowski came to me 
on Monday and said, you keep your nose off the silver side, you're not getting it. I already been awarded it. <laughs> I said, oh, Dan, I said, thank you. I said, we'll keep that in mind. But no, Dan Rostenkowski at the time that the Silver Sides came to Chicago um, had just left being the alderman and had just become the congressman from the district where Chicago is. And I know he's quoted in a lot of the newspapers as saying that he fought very hard to keep the Silver Sides in Chicago. Um, but from what you're saying is he didn't enter the show until after it had been awarded to well, you. Well, you know, Dan Rostenkowski was one of the people charged with Miss, Miss, Miss Neely and the Silver Side, so I don't know if people realize that or not. But. Hmm. Uh, where, does the, where did the mayor, Harold Washington, fit into this? Because uh, where did the mayor, Harold, I think Harold Washington, uh, we read about him not being happy with us or... Well, they weren't, none of them were real happy about it, but uh, uh, they were heavy, there was improprieties. Okay. There was many, uh, there was no money being paid to the city, the, they were behind on dues, they were, um, in fact they were sending trucks to the Navy Yard and getting surplus off the Navy Yards at what the silver size is a reason for it. And the Navy knew this, I knew this, they told us about it. Um, I said, I'll tell you one thing, no games will be played in Muskegon. It'll be an honest above board. And we did that. We, we kept it. But it was a, it was a real, you know, a wonderful thing to have. We uh, kind of feel kind of proud of that achievement, so. It's a great achievement to have it there, and have it here in Muskegon. Tell me, who did you meet in Washington, D.C.? And who did you first go to for the start filling out the paperwork? Well, uh, the guy's name was, oh boy, that was 20 years ago. Yeah, I, I, I asked the hard questions. 30 yeah. years ago. 30 now. years 30 ago. 30 years ago. 30 years. Uh, uh, I remember the, young, uh, the man I met in Chicago or in the Navy that actually was in charge of the story ships. He was just a tremendous, I mean, you talk about upright. And he told me, he said, you know, he said, the Silver Sides deserves a better home because of the improprieties and the people that were, well, things were disappearing that shouldn't, and they were being used as a play games with the Navy. And he said, we really feel that uh, the Silver Sides and the whole thing, and I assured him that if I come to Muskegon, it would be an honest, and it was. So. Bob, wow, was that ship originally destined to be a Great Lake Naval Training Center? Because there's something I've been reading, and maybe I'm wrong. Well, I have no idea why they. It was. It was. Uh, Chicago got it. They had it about two years, and uh, it was supposed to be a museum open to the public, and a public display. Of course, that's what we wanted it for, mm -hmm. and uh, unfortunately. Uh, the improprieties, uh, I think, at least it, I have no proof of it all. I know is what I was told that uh, and by the Navy and by uh, several people in Chicago that, that uh, it was being used improperly. The dues were being, uh, were not going back to the city. They're going in people's pockets and uh, improprieties is what got rid of it for Chicago. What struck up your interest in bringing a military ship to Muskegon? Well, you know, it was funny. I rode the destroyer back from Chicago to Muskegon, and I'm a naval person myself, and I asked the captain, and I said, how would we get something like this if we're just playing Muskegon? And he said, it's funny, we're going on, we're going to be eligible for display. So I put in for it, and I was approved. Well, then the Navy decided to keep the, that's when they gave me the Newport News, and I went and looked at that, and it was just more than we could handle. It was just, you know, we'd been spending millions of debt for a million dollars just to get it 
on display. The Newport News was the one that had the gaping hole in the middle? Yeah, they'd be taking a gun tour out of mm -hmm. the center of the ship and, you know, it was just in, it was an 800 foot ship and it was just, I felt it was just insurmountable for us to, yeah. I was ambitious but not that ambitious to want to get in tackle something like that. But I did think a naval display would be appropriate for Muskegon, so. What about, um, you talked about Mr. Freitag, what about Mr. Carroll? What do you remember of Mr. Carroll from the one that was uh, part of the group in Chicago that was trying to preserve the silver sides? Well, there was a, uh, there were some wonderful people on Chicago's board, don't get me wrong. And they had, uh, I remember Dr. Shabika, and I, he spent with, I spent hours with him in Chicago and he was, he wanted to keep the ship but he realized that it was not going the right direction so, but we, there were some good people in Chicago, believe me, and um, if there would have been any way that they would have salvaged it, we would have backed off from it, but the Navy was pretty well uh, convinced that it was going to, they were going to take it off from Navy Pier. They lost their mooring there. And with that, they had no place to go with us. So. Was there any concern when you were towing it across the lake that maybe something was open and that it wouldn't die for the last time? Or <laughs> the what? Navy told me they had to have Force One. In other words, it couldn't be over one foot waves. And it could be, they put conditions on the ship that, you know, are almost impossible. And um, San Andre, who owned the towing company here in Muskegon, uh, and I were friends, and I talked him into bringing the ship over with one of his tugs. And uh, I told him, I said, Force One wins, and you have to sign. He said, you let the towing our business. That's what we do for a living. And so when the day Friday came, uh, there were waves out there, but I didn't even bother to find out what they were. I was ever so happy to see a tug pull up and pull a ship out of there. <laughs> we didn't worry about a force one winds. And... Did he just bring the one tug, or were there more than one tugs when you went there across? There were two it? tugs. And where were they placed? Pardon? Where were they placed? On the... Were they well? One of them was uh, one of them was actually berthed alongside of it, and okay. then I think they they really reduced the line and they towed it. Okay. But they, one of them was just a follow-up tug, and they they played it pretty safe. And they knew what they were doing, and it got into Muskegon about eleven o'clock at night, and we still didn't have a place to moor at Muskegon. Uh, it was, it was what I was hoping for was the winter property and um, that's where I was all hopes for. Well then a naval officer from the Naval Reserve one day walked up to me and said, Bob, would you like to think about putting it out the at the channel? And he said, There's nineteen acres available there and he said, you know, there's a beautiful slip. He said, I can help you with that. Hmm. Well I jumped on it and we uh, what was that gentleman's name again? Pardon? The gentleman from the Naval Reserve? There was an officer from the Naval Reserve, and I don't have his name. I'm awful sorry that oh, I don't. Right. But he was, he was one that you know told me about the Naval Reserve, and oh, it just seemed like a natural. So, and it's been a wonderful fit. Were you involved when? Was the submarine towed downtown at one time, or was it just being considered to go downtown? What's that? The to, yeah, to be down at the McKee property in that area. Well, we wanted downtown, and that's where we, were. we had every intention of going. Mm -hmm. But this, the Naval Reserve Center came up, and they were just too much to pass up. Oh, so I see. Okay. The property was there. The, uh, uh, we bought the ship. There was 19, or about, Sixty thousand dollars owed on the ship in Chicago, and believe it or not, what what really hurt is that most of this was wages that had been promised to Wayne Smith, who was running it, and um, he was making his money off of salvage. But he, 
he still sent a bill and we honored it. Mm -hmm. We paid off all Chicago's bills and had the ship free and clear before we ever looked for a place to dock it here. And we raised the 60000 paid everything off in Chicago. Is this where Tom Keenan and others were involved in raising That's this That's where I got Tom Keenan involved. Yeah. Tom Keenan was my neighbor, by the way. Oh, okay. He was running Continental Motors. Yeah. Yeah. And Tom was just, I can't say enough nice about him. I'll tell you, he's just a real gentleman and he's well, a nice person. He's become a friend of ours now. He's been out a number of times in Peg and I and Wes have all met him. He's, he's well, still he's thinking. Just, he's, he's just one real nice person. That's yeah. all I can yeah. say about him. Yeah. Um, tell me the group of people that were involved. I know it was you and I know it was Mr. Keenan. Who else in the Muskegon area was assisting you in um, the paperwork and the legal things and paying off the bills and um, the transfer here? Oh boy. I asked the hard questions here. I'll have to think about that for a while. Okay. Yeah, and as I you think about it, just say it and we'll We'll think about it because the records are not as complete as we would like them for that point. Um, but going back to Chicago, did you feel that the submarine was well physically cared for? It was what? Physically cared for in Chicago. I know you no, said that it they wasn't. They were actually, unfortunately, it was being it was being taken apart piece by piece. Uh, there were many things missing when we got it. Uh, there was some improprieties, and you, you know, you hate to point fingers or that's past history, but uh, it was improprieties that the Navy let it go. Believe me, the Navy knew. <laughs> they may be quiet, and they may be, but the meetings I had with them, I went to Washington and met with them. And he told me, he says, you got to realize what you're getting. He said, you may not get a complete submarine. There may be some, you know, he said, there, there's quite a few things missing and that are probably will never be returned. Well, we did get most of it back and, and uh, it was a good trade. We were happy to get it, so. You say trade. Yeah. Did we, other than paying the staff bills and their last of their debts for the company that was running the Silver Sides, was there anything else that, you know, do we have to pay any other bills for it? Well, there was a... And of course the towing. <laughs> from what I gather, there was money collected from dues that was disappearing and there was just improprieties and we assured them that that would not happen in Muskegon, believe me. That would be an honest and well, all of us, we had a, you know, people that got involved like Tom Keenan. You don't even pinch Tom Keenan. You just, you, you don't get him involved and play games. You, you're above board, you're honest, and that's what we wanted from day one. And we got it and we made sure that it was just, a uh, labor of love, of course. I'm a Navy guy, and it was a labor of love too. So, hmm. um, how did in the early years you gather the group of submariners that took such good care of her when she came to Muskegon? Um, how did you gather the group of submariners, such as Mr. Jacobson and the other people? that really helped take good care of her after she got to Muskegon? Well, I don't think there's any problem once we got the submarine getting Volunteers were there. We knew that. Yeah, yeah. And the people, people in Muskegon really put their heart out for it. And uh, uh, we knew that, you know, once we had it, it would get good uh, taken care of. And I will say that the crew that was involved when it was honest, they were forthright and they were hardworking. So it was a labor of love. Oh, that's good. Um, <clears throat> when you first came to Muskegon, that night that it was pulled into the channel, did Muskegon give you a resounding welcome? Was there a lot of people lining well, that channel? A hundred foot behind, two hundred foot behind the submarine. So I never saw it go through the channel. Huh. I rode the tug from Chicago back and we, uh, unfortunately we had a captain that didn't want to get near the submarine because they didn't want to, you know, get any damage, so I, we didn't see it go through the channel. We were 
It was at night about 11 o'clock at night. Patients? Yeah, one of the machines and disc jockeys, and he rode a, the tug that I was on, and we talked about bringing this, you know, what it would do for Muskegon. What, what were your hopes of what it would do for Muskegon? Well, we wanted to make a museum out of it. We knew that uh, Muskegon is kind of a naval town. Every time we've had anything to do with the Navy here, it's been real good. And so the hopes were that it would be accepted as a, as a welcome addition to a, to a tourist attraction. When you were in Chicago, did you ever get a chance to meet Mayor Washington? No, I didn't. Oh, I did too. I met him, but Ross Sienkowski and, um, oh, there were several people in Chicago I met with. Uh, it was two years. Mm -hmm. It was in Chicago when we first put our application in for it. So. You know, Bob, part of the reason that we wanted to do this is the fact that 2017, next year, marks 30 years that that submarine will be in this town. 30 years. Yeah, well, I told them once we got the submarine, it would be permanent, it would be taken care of, and get the proper, what the submarine needed was an honest people who, whose love was for the submarine, and not for what the submarine could give to them, but what it would do for the community and what a, what a naval museum was. And, and I think that was very apparent from the start. So, and you know, once you get a guy like Tom Keenan involved, he was a big hitter. Tom was my next door neighbor, and, and I can't say enough nice about him, I'll tell you that. So when you were, um, when you were looking to bring the Silver Sides from Chicago, to Muskegon. Were you already retired or were you still working? Oh no, I was working. Mm -hmm. uh, I was. I worked for a hundred years at a supply company and of course this was just kind of a hobby with me. I love Navy ships and mid Navy. And I, I retired, uh, well I spent, the, I spent 20 years running the submarine after mm -hmm. I retired so. Yeah. I was 33 years at a hundred years and then when I retired, I, I took over the submarine. That's good. Um, so, when you were, what was the general talk at your company? Were they excited about hearing about a submarine coming to Chicago? Or were people just kind of, well, it's just that? Well, we, uh, are you talking about Chicago people? No, here in Muskegon. Oh, I think I got a wonderful reception here in Muskegon. I had some, I had some good hitters. Um, I don't know how many people know Tom Keenan very well, but he's a real gentleman, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you get a guy like him behind you, he's quiet behind him, and you know you've got a winner if you get him. What about, um, <clears throat> who was the mayor in Muskegon, when, and what kind of support oh. did the mayor give you? Boy. That wasn't Norm Cruzy, was it? Right? Wasn't Norm Cruzy? No, I don't think it was Norm. Well, yeah. it might have been Norm Cruzy, yes. Yeah. yeah. And he was with Seal Power. Yeah, he was Seal Power, yeah. but he was for it. You know, it has to be Norm Cruzy because... Yeah, I think it was yeah. Norm Cruzy. Yeah, he got and involved. Norm and I were friends in the Chamber of Commerce together. Okay. okay. And I worked on several committees with him, so... Yeah. Sure, because uh, that's about the time he retired because then he became associated with the, uh, the college. Okay. Uh, and job development training, and so and he really was a Muskegon supporter, big time. He was a good Muskegon yeah. supporter. Yeah, a big red, isn't he? Mm -hmm. I think. Were you a big red too? I'm a big red. Oh right. well, okay. There you go. That tells it. That tells you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, <coughs> Peterson played the big reds at the time. He was purchasing an anaconda, and I spent thirty some years there. Okay. So Howie and I were awful good friends. So. Okay. So um, the mayor was for it, and he was able to help you secure a location with the Naval Reserve area. How did, when you first pulled it into the channel of Muskegon, you said you didn't quite know where you were going with it. Where did you end up going? Yeah, well, um, um, I think uh, on Third Street Dock, down, downtown uh, Norm Cruzy, 
And uh, they owned a slip down there where they operated out of. So they let me tie up on their slip. And I think it was. Their, their slip was big enough for a sub. Oh, yeah, it was big enough for it. And uh, we had it with the, no visitors. That was the. Uh, nobody could go aboard it. And the cruisy's dock was off of 3rd Street, you said? Pardon? The, you said the cruisy's dock was off of 3rd Street? I'm sorry. The cru the dock that the cruisies owned that they allowed you to dock up They to allowed me to dock it, yes. And it was around 3rd Street downtown? Yeah. Okay. And when you got it into the 3rd Street dock and you tied it up and the tugs went away, what was the first thing you did? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it was uh, the next day um, I, I went aboard it. There was no power aboard it, no lights, no nothing. We had no uh, facilities. And um, I think it was the mayor and I and several other people, and uh, they toured it. I, of course, had been aboard it many times in Chicago before this. And um, we went aboard it and we talked about where we were going to go. I had no idea we were going out the channel. That came. Oh, almost several weeks or months after we got it on 3rd Street. And they came with that idea of 19 acres and, we, and, you know, it was a place to build a museum and do all the things we wanted to do. But it wasn't where we really intended it to go. But uh, it seemed like a natural fit, so. So where did you, in your mind, when you were towing it over, you knew you were going to put it at the cruisy dock, where would have been your ideal position for it in Muskegon? Pardon? Where would your ideal position for the submarine Well, it should have been, an ideal spot for it would have been the, uh, uh, oh, the, the property, I'm trying to think of the bay right next to Hartshorn, and that slip where... Um, oh, Heritage Landing? Heritage or? Landing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That would have been the place for it. Yeah. That's where we kind of intended it to be. And that didn't come through because that um, the, the city didn't want it down there? There wasn't enough public Well, there was no opposition to putting it there at the time. <clears throat> of course, there's opposition to everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, when, they, when the naval officer, and I'm trying to think of his name now. But oh, it'll come to you. Don't worry. Yeah, uh, he came to me and he said, you know, why don't you think about the channel, about the Naval Reserve Center, and you know, there's nothing here. We have no, this was a place of 19 acres you could get from the city. You could put a building up there, and and we, we did that, so. And you got the Quonset Huts as part of the deal, I understand. Yeah, Quonset Hut was part of the deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when did you guys knock down the Quonset hut? <laughs> when we put the museum up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But we had a lot of, you know, a lot of good people in Muskegon came forth and opened our hearts up to it. And it, was, it was one of those things, you know, it was an idea, you get an idea. Um, Muskegon needed a, a museum and it just seemed like a natural. Yeah. So you had it at the Cruises dock, you really wanted it at Heritage Landing. But before it went out to the channel to the Naval Reserve, was there another spot somewhere downtown that you were for a little while? Oh, I think we looked at several places. About every place that we probably put a ship. We had that Muskegon map out many times. But um, uh, I think the natural fit where were some of the other places that you considered? Do you remember the names of them? Was oh, the well, you know, it's been 20 years oh, ago. Oh, I know, I know. I just like to try and think of some of the yeah. other potential places you thought about putting it in. I mean, we're so lucky to have such a deep water lake. Mm -hmm. Oh, we really were. You know, Muskegon uh, is a port city, and having a submarine, of course, the submarines are unique. To the Midwest, we don't, they're not like something on the coast where they have them every day. It's kind of a unique thing to have. That's what made the submarine so unique to, to my mind. Oh, it's very unique. It's very unique. So when you were planning and you got the submarine in Chicago, did, and you said you were planning to have a museum, what were your initial thoughts as to how big the museum would be and what type of things you would have in the museum? and how you would fund the museum, and how you would fund 
the well, care and restoration. I, I wasn't so really this. worried. Um, it doesn't. A submarine is not a. It's not a high. Well, in a way, it is, but it's not a high a high item to, to maintain. And um, uh, I felt that. Well, we put the numbers together real quick to see what it would take to maintain the submarine. And I think we came up with, in Barrow, if we could come up with 19000 a year, we could maintain the submarine. What, you know, that wouldn't be, that'd be the bare minimum one, but then we thought we had no problem there. And <clears throat> in fact, we raised, you know, oh, I don't know, almost 60000 to pay off the debts. So we didn't want any debt on that submarine whatsoever. And so before it ever went on display, it was paid for. With Chicago, it was paid off, 100 percent. And um, Andrea towed it here, you know, for a dollar. And uh, there was just so many things like the nice people that came by. And then so the city of Muskegon and the community of Muskegon, the entire area here, really supported your bringing the submarine here. Oh yes, I had. Well, I had a couple of negative people, and there always is. You know, some people, oh, well, it'll just another year, it'll be gone. It'll be one of those things, you know. It'll last six months, and then people get tired of it. They'll go through it once. That'll be the end of it. There was an awful lot of that time, but it was just a, that was a minority. The, the average naval guy in Muskegon was pretty much for us. So, do you know that we? have approximately 35,000 visitors a year now. Uh, they do? Yeah, 35,000. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. We, were, we were hoping for, you know, 20,000 at, at, when we got it here. We thought that would be a good number. We ever get to that number where we put numbers together and follow what we had to do. But it was kind of a labor of love, too, I'll tell you. I'm a Navy guy. And, it was, it was a fun thing to do, and I got to go three days on the nuclear silver side under the ocean. So oh, did you really? oh, wow. I took a cruise on the nuclear silver side, so. Yeah, that would have been wonderful if we could have had the nuclear one here. Well, too. we almost did, believe it or not. The Navy all of a sudden decided that uh, the, the uh, nuclear submarines have too many no-nos. Mm -hmm. that our public that kind of put a stop to it, but they were very, very seriously considering it. It was, it was at, the, at the time, it was, it was a hot topic. Yeah, I can imagine, but I'm just excited that we have the parts of well, the nuclear submarine that we do. You know, we that did makes get the conning tower and all the equipment off it, a lot of equipment, much more than normally. We, uh, Captain Sher, who was the captain of the Silver Sides, uh, was, took a liking, and so he was a great guy. He was on the board for a few years, and, uh, and he helped us get, you know, we rated the nuclear Silver Sides pretty well. So we were able to get quite a bit from it from the Navy. And Who was the fellow Captain Who, please? Pardon? Captain Who, what, the captain? Okay. Larkin. Larkin, okay. All right. And he's from the, um, the nuclear summary. Yeah. Great. Um, so you're in Muskegon, you are got it down at the dock, and you're talking about well, what should we do with it for permanent, what should we do to display it. What were some of the first things that you had to do to make the ship ready for its first visitors? Of course, electricity is always a plus. Um, well, one of the things that we, <clears throat> the conning tower had to be a, a no no for for, uh, for touring. It just didn't blend into touring. Mm -hmm. So we had to decide how we could make sure that people could see the submarine and enjoy it. And yeah, I go up in the conning tower. So what we did, we had a video of the conning tower they could see. But that was probably one of the one of the shortcomings, but um, overall, I think uh, uh, we just had a good crew together. That's good. So you decided that the tour 
would just be the cruise cabins. You would not do the conning tower. You would not do any other parts of the the ship other than the cruise. Basically, where oh no, the whole ship was made available. Uh, we uh, send to CERN. Okay. But um, with the conning tower just didn't blend in going up a flight of stairs. It was a very small area up there. Were the staircases already cut into the torpedo rooms when you brought her no, from Chicago? No, that was added. And who, well, how did you come up with the thought of where to take out uh, the... Um, whose idea was it to put them into the two different areas in the torpedo rooms? Well, I think it was a, probably a bunch of ideas. Everybody, everybody kind of pitched in and said, let's do this and do that. And, mm -hmm. Oh, after I'd gone here, we had an awful lot of good people, so... Well, that's good. And so you all just kind of decided that that would be yeah. the best place for the easiest people, for people to get in and to get mm -hmm. out. And um, so, did you guys do all of that work yourselves? No, well, believe it or not, the Navy Reserve came in awful handy. They really did. They, they were very happy to work on it. The Naval Reserve officers were delighted to have the ship, and. Uh, it was kind of a lucky marriage. It was a. You couldn't do this alone. You, you had to have the backing of the people, and, and thank goodness for uh, you know the people that were involved. Or when she came over from Chicago, she didn't have a full complement of torpedoes. I know some of the torpedoes were loaded here. Yeah. How did you guys do the torpedo loading? Oh, we we uh, confiscated. I think it was 11 torpedoes involved or 12. From we Chicago? We ended up giving three or four of them away. I, you know, there several other submarines around the country needed them. And so we thought we didn't need that many, so uh, we reluctantly gave some of them up. But we kept those that we have on display We now. recently um, had one return to, uh, one we brought back from the North Muskegon VFW. Pardon? We recently, last December, a year ago December, so 15, 16 months ago, we had one of the torpedoes came back to us from the VFW in North Muskegon. So... From the VFW? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That one came back to us. And when yeah, the, back at the museum. It's back at the museum. And Ramos is on Getty Street. They stripped it and painted it and fixed all the rust in it and made it look beautiful. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, but talk about, um, now I know we loaded some of the torpedoes onto the silver sides. How did you go about loading them on? Do you remember how you loaded them onto the silver sides when it was in the channel at the Naval Reserve Center? I don't recall us ever putting them aboard the silver sides. Okay. Okay. And those that we have were board that we left, and and of course most of the fourteen of them or whatever it was was uh, loose in Chicago, so they were actually a separate acquisition from the Navy. Okay. Good. Um. So now, when you get to the Naval Reserve Center there. And they've got the Quonset huts, and they knock down the Quonset huts. We bring in the trailers, and you decide then it's the right time to start the overnight program. Whose idea was it to start the overnight program where the scouts sleep on the side? Well, the overnight program was, believe it or not, that is a carryover in Chicago. They had an overnight program on a weekend, which involved maybe 12 or 14 people. Mm -hmm. And the Boy Scouts were ones that were behind, kind of behind it. And I went over there and saw the program. And I th it just seems like such a natural. And when we, uh, you know, made mention the fact we'd have an overnight program, the response was just unbelievable. So uh, it became a reality. And we were, you know, we were 300 a weekend on that submarine. So. And it seemed like a real money maker for us, and and besides being a, a natural to promote the ship, so the two of them just went hand in hand. 
So when you started it up, did you mostly get scouts from the Michigan area, or did you still get a lot from the Chicago Council? Oh, coming a up lot of Chicago people, a tremendous amount of Chicago. In fact, I made the, I was on the air in Chicago the, the uh, night we brought the submarine to Muskegon in Chicago, and they said, what are your plans for Muskegon? And I said, to bring all the people who haven't had a chance to see the ship in Chicago to Muskegon. I said for overnights, and I said we're going to welcome you with open arms, and we did, and they did too. They they came and drove. So well, that's good. So you were on WGN radio the night that the Silver Sides left Chicago. Oh yeah, I was on. In fact, I went on at eleven o'clock at night, got off about two thirty in the morning. So it was a short night. I know that. Well, you were probably very excited. So you towed yeah. the submarine and. Late at night, not during the, the daylight hours. You went over late at night? Yeah. Well, good, good. And um, how long did it take you to tow the Silver Sides from Chicago? Or tow, or tow. So, yeah, if you left at 11 o'clock at night, that would make perfect sense for why it was 11 o'clock when you're getting in and all the people were waiting then. So, what's your, when you first pulled away from the dock, on Navy Pier and out into the open water. Were you relieved that she was still floating? Well, you know, I was on the tug and we were, they, they pulled in, they got the, the submarine on her tow and then we cleared the dock. We didn't clear the dock for, we had to, several things we had to get aboard the tug and, and uh, so we probably left a half hour, 45 minutes after they cleared the, the dock and uh, but it was quite a sigh of relief to see it go through the channel, I'll tell you that. Yeah. A wonderful feeling of, of accomplishment, so. Well, the dock at um, Navy Pier is much different than the dock is on our Muskegon side because Navy yes. Pier is, what, about a mile out into the lake, it seems mm -hmm. like? And so there must have been other vessels you had to been worried about as you were pulling well, out well, of the dock. Well, right they were right at the dock in Navy Pier in Chicago. Mm -hmm. They were right downtown. So, um, because the way Navy Pier is, you know, you've got Navy Pier jutting out for about a mile, and then you've got several other ships in that area. Yeah. Did you have any concerns about with them tugging the Silver Sides out away from Navy Pier before you hit open water on Lake you Michigan? Know, uh, we had uh, Captain Larkin uh, went over to Chicago. The fact that two of us went over to Chicago, and he looked it all over, and he says, "Not a problem, Bob." So. He had it all under control. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> leave it in the expert hands. You don't try to outguess the experts. So what was, was Larkin's company's name? Pardon? The company that uh, Mr. Larkin ran here? It was, uh, oh boy. I know, I'm sorry. I ask all the tough questions. Yeah, it's hard. Uh, well, if we think of it, we'll throw it in there. Okay. But just, yeah. So, they were, they were just absolutely. There were an awful lot of good people, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Who else was on the tug with you when you came back from Chicago? Uh, Walter Larkin and um, oh, a reporter from W, one of the radio stations here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there was... And probably the gentleman from WGN too? Yeah. Was there any fanfare on the Chicago side when they sent you off? Burden. Was there any fanfare on Chicago, or was I it think quietly? There were about seven or eight people on the dock when we left. <laughs> so nothing, <laughs> nothing. Were those the people that were left on the dock? Were those the ones that were trying to keep her healthy in Chicago, or were those just people? Well, I don't think it was a big move to keep her in Chicago. Um, and there was a lot of emotions. A lot of people said, "Well, you know." They'll never support it in Muskegon. We're a great big city. We can support this. They never supported Muskegon. It'll never fly. It'll never go. We get naysayers wherever, you know. But and there is a certain amount of gamble to it. There's no question of it. Oh yeah. You're you know you have your you have your doubts and you have your but if it's an idea if it's if a good idea and. It, if it's done right, it'll, you know, I just had confidence there to go. That's good. So, um, you get to Chicago, you, I mean, excuse me, you leave Chicago, 
You spend 12 hours crossing Lake Michigan going at a snail's pace across the lake and the waves are very calm because you planned it to make sure it was in a calm, calm night. And you pull into the channel. All these people from Muskegon are greeting you. You park her at the dock off of 3rd Street. And then you take a sigh of relief. <laughs> well, uh, actually, by the time they, uh, time they had it in the 3rd Street dock, <coughs> we were at the top where we were docking somewhere else. We were on 3rd Street. And it was time to go home and go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a long night. And, and uh, it was just a, well, it was a feeling of accomplishment. It really was. It was something that I felt in the sea. And I don't know, I just, I just felt good about it. Tell me a little bit about the early days when the LST and the Silver Sides thought about getting together. I well, know how it ended, so we don't we have to talk together. about it. We were together. Don't thought about it. We were two years together. We started the LST. Um, um, McKee from McKee had the LST, and that was going to be donated to us at the end of two years. Well, we put probably over a hundred thousand dollars in the LST, silver sized in the museum, and. Uh, uh, one of our board members was, of course, I had some board members who were not LSC people, and one of them made a motion one day at the board meeting that we discontinue at the end of the month the LST, and unfortunately it passed by, you know, by the board. Mm -hmm. So that was the end of it. But we did spend two years putting the LST together, and uh, I thought they were a winning combination. Of course, I served on an LSC, so um, I thought it was kind of a winning combination, but... Yeah, well, it didn't work out. It's all past history. But yeah. the two of them work, on our work out pretty good together. There's no question of it. Oh, yeah. And I'm glad we got both of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about your military background. Pardon? Tell me a little bit about your military service. Well, I was in the CBs, the construction battalion, and um, my first involvement with LST was we went to Greenland to build a naval base up in Greenland, and we spent six months living aboard one. So that's my first introduction to an LST. That's quite an introduction. <laughs> well, from there, believe it or not, I, I came home, I was home two weeks, and I flew to Africa, and I spent the next two and a half years in Africa. Uh, at, uh, oh, just north of Casablanca, and uh, uh, that CB, a big CB air base there. What year was this? Um, 46, 47, 48. Hmm. Okay. And so, um, so you were in Greenland, and then you spent time in Africa. And you spent three years in two or two and a half, three years. I in spent Africa. four years in the Navy. I was a Navy surveyor. Okay. I was in the Seabees, and we were a construction battalion, and I was a surveyor for them. So. Good. And then you came back after your time in the military, and what did you do here back in Muskegon? I went to work for. Um, Hunter Hughes, I think. Hunter, well, no, it was a company before Hunter Hughes, yeah. But uh, I went to work, I spent 31 years there, so. So you were not in insurance then? You were in a more of a construction related? Right. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Did you learn to do the surveying in the Navy, or was that the skill <laughs> that you had before you Believe went? Believe it or not, when I went to the Navy, um, I wanted to be a. Uh, I don't know what I put in for, but we made the they made the hot fudge sundays in the galley, <laughs> and boy, I thought that was really neat. <laughs> so I put in for uh, galley duty, and we had Lieutenant Johnson. I'll never forget him. He, he called me aside one day and he said, "You can forget about the fudge." He says, "You're going to the surveyor." My <laughs> said, "Your chests are all." pointing towards that, so I became a Navy surveyor for him. So, and you graduated from Muskegon High School? Pardon? You're a big red, you graduated from Muskegon High School? Mm -hmm. 
What year did you graduate? In 45. 45. Well, actually, 46. I left the last year of high school. I made it up on the GED test. So. So you caught the very tail end of World War II then? Mm-hmm. And is that when you were up in Greenland first? Yeah, I went to Greenland. We went to Northern Greenland and spent six months up there building a, believe it or not, building a naval refueling base up there. Well, thank goodness we didn't need it so much <laughs> after that point. Um, well, that's good. And then from there you spent the next couple of the post-war years, and then you came back to Muskegon and you got your first job here at another company. And what were you doing at that company? That Pardon? When you first came back after the war, 48, 49, what were you... Well, uh, actually, I don't know. I spent... Uh, I don't know what I did before I... I, uh, I joined Hunter Hughes. Uh, Malcolm Hughes was a friend of mine, a very close friend. And one day he called me and he said, <clears throat> We're looking for somebody. For, uh, we're, we're, we want to start a you know, company here. We, and he said, you got a surveyor background from the Navy. And I said, yeah. And he said, would you like it? Give it a shot. And I served me. So that was so I 31 years later. Mm -hmm. well, that's good. That's a good company then to work they for. They were a probably. wonderful company. That's good. And then you retired from them and you entered into your new career. Oh, I retired from, we had the, the uh, uh, submarine and uh, I ran that for 20 years in the labor of love. Yeah. Tell me about some of your highlights from running the submarine. So you started in 80, well, let's say probably you were very active in getting the submarine from 84 onward. 1984 would have been about two and a half years before it came to... Uh, well, actually, I think it was 70. In the 70s, we started. Okay, so yeah. it took a lot longer yeah. to start investigating to get it to come here. Okay. And so, um, so you were pretty much, even though you were working someplace else, you were doing this in your spare time and your off hours and stuff like that, mm -hmm. pursuing going to get another uh, a vessel for Muskegon. Yeah. But, and then um, you, um, when you retired, then you were running the Silver Sides here. Tell me some of the highlights that you remember. What are the best times? Well, I think the, the best times were, were probably the um, all having the ships, reunions, having um, the submar different submarines around the country come and have their reunions aboard it. Um, and setting and exchanging stories with, uh, it was just, you know, it was, I don't know, it just seemed like it was kind of a, a relaxed atmosphere when, when they'd all get together, people from other submarines sit down and talk about it, and, and um, believe it or not, many times, every time they'd come, they'd bring something from their submarine and add to our submarine, That's, that happened many, many times. We'd mention that we're, we're missing this or this and this in the cutting tower, and sure enough, here it would be. It means, well, we aren't going to miss it off our ship. So, <laughs> yeah, so many times, I just found out that people are wonderful people. If they're... You know, your successor was a fellow by the name of Brian Hughes. Was he related to the Hunter Hughes company? Or Who was that? Brian Hughes. Brian. He followed you, I think. After you retired from the museum, I think Brian was the next director. And then he died unexpectedly in 2011. Brian Hughes, boy, the name. I should remember. Okay. Okay. Well, you've created a museum that attracts a lot of people, and now in the last three, four years, the lecture series that we've established out there, and you've been to a few of those lecture series. Mm -hmm. And I remember the look on your face, the glee, and you came in, you said, this is what you always thought it should be, an educational, historical museum. And those continue. Those continue. Well, you know, there was enough people negative about it that it would never last. It would just be a, you know, one of the flash-in-the-pan things. And we knew that 
And historically, the Navy, this is a good Navy town, believe it or not. It really is. And uh, we knew we had, we did it right. We had no improprieties. That's one of the things you can't have is any talk of impropriety. If we ran it, I mean, kept our nose clean, we'd, we'd have something. And I think that's been done over the years, so. I think we've always been fortunate to have honest people. Were you, um, in the early stages when you were just envisioning your concept of the museum and the silver sides, and you got them all started, you know you're going to stay at the Naval Reserve Center, what was your dream for what the building would be like and what you would like to have seen inside of the building? Well, you know, that's a funny thing. Um, <clears throat> my idea of what should have been inside the building and what first happened are two different things. Uh, unfortunately, we had <clears throat> a couple of directors who had the power to, to say um, what they wanted was, unfortunately, um, are you talking board members? Yeah, okay. they, and what they wanted was, now when we were back to where I wanted to be 20 years ago, but uh, they had, their idea was that we'll put walls up, we'll put, we'll put uh, pictures on the walls, but that's it. You know, that's what their idea of a museum was. My idea was having displays out of a submarine going to the different Navy yards and getting, actual getting parts of submarines and, and building displays and that's what we're doing now. So it took 20 years to get that, get that across, but it did start out that way. So um, were you there for the initial design of the building? I was active in the building. Well, actually the building kind of grew. When you first thought about the building, did you think it should be bigger or smaller or look different? Should it look, you know? Well, we had a lot of, we had an architect involved, of course, and a volunteer, by the way. Yeah. And uh, we, had, we had a lot of advice. And you don't do this alone. Yeah, a program like this just takes a lot of people. Was there any thought of just leaving the Quonset huts up and using them as the museum building? I'm sorry. Was there any discussion of just leaving the Quonset huts up that the Naval Reserve was using? No, not really after we started the building. Were the Quonset huts in poor shape at the Naval Reserve area? Were the buildings that were there in poor shape when you took over the property? Yeah, they were. There. Uh, we took over the property because the quads that she had coming pretty handy at the time, but there were some good people involved, believe me. Good. good. So tell me what you thought are some, we talked about some of the positive times. Tell me about some of the, the not positive times, the hardest parts. Oh gosh, I don't know. I know we always like to think all the positive things. We don't like to think about the hardships. But you did a lot of work to make, you know, you had to overcome a lot of adversity yes, to get well, it there. And so what were some of those biggest challenges? Yes, the biggest challenge was probably um, asbestos related, trying to separate asbestos related from, so we didn't get involved in the museum so that it could make, and the Navy had a real thing about the time we brought the submarine. That was a big negative, asbestos. And uh, it was one of the big things we had to worry about and work around. Mm -hmm. So it was one of the, one of the, and the submarine was full of asbestos. There's no question about that. So uh, it was one of the negatives that we. Yeah, that would have been a very difficult challenge to be able yeah, to deal really with well, the asbestos. We had the, we had, well, we can enclose it or remove it. Well, we remove what we could and we enclose the rest of it, so. Mm -hmm. But we did get, we were very fortunate. Uh, um, a fellow from the Navy, um, I'm just trying to think of his name now. Boy, those names split me, but. Um, Your memory is wonderful, though. It's very, very good. You know, he, 
and I got on the phone. In fact, I'd be on the phone daily with him. And brother, he was absolutely marvelous. He was uh, in charge of shore ships of the Navy. It was his job to get them in place around the country. And um, he had a tremendous job. And, and I, I'd call him up and he'd advice. I'd tell him, you know, what our problems were every day. I'll call them up and see if they'll mail it to you or ship it to you. And that happened so many times. And it was, you know, the cooperation, people don't realize it. it's not one person, but it's a lot of people working together that made it. And that's what put this one together too, so. So the asbestos removal in a case when it was a big challenge for you? It was a challenge. Yeah. What were some of the other big challenges you faced? Well, um, actually, the access around the ship to make sure, you know, there was uh, the flow of traffic was uh, ladders and, and stairways or things you have to overcome. Mm -hmm. And so we have access to the ship, we have asbestos. Um, was there any challenges with the property because it was so close to the channel being wet and mushy? No, well, we couldn't get, we, we um, thank goodness for, <laughs> I don't know how many times we had uh, dredging done out there. They couldn't dredge in the channel. So what they did, they come out with their dredges and they wouldn't bring their bucket above the water line. <laughs> Everything was moved underwater to make room for it to get it up along the side. Oh. With the approval of, uh, I will say, the Navy was well aware of what we were doing. Explain that again. Tell us exactly how that happened. So the Well, we couldn't get the ship. We were probably 20, 25 feet from the shallow wall. The wall went down and we couldn't bring the submarine any closer than that. So what we wanted to do was actually bring the submarine up closer so we had to move all those stones well that's a government project in order to do that it would have been impossible so we had uh, we had some uh, again construction people and agreed to come in and work on it and the buckets never left the service never they just moved everything <laughs> underwater so we didn't have to get from us to, and it all worked out okay. Well, that's good. Oh, interesting. Okay. But it was the kind of thing that, you know, was done because of love of mm -hmm. wanting to do something. So then you had negotiations with the Army Corps of Engineers too, I imagine, right? Pardon? With, you must have had negotiations with the Army Corps of Engineers. Oh, many times. Yeah. Yeah, yeah many, many times. And most of them are very, fairly, I can't think of any real negative. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. If you kept them informed of what you were doing, and mm -hmm. <laughs> they knew we were playing games with that wall, so. Okay. But again, they knew that we were, everything we were doing was with naval approval, was just, yeah. we weren't going to, safety was a big item, sure. so. Sure. So, um, how did you acquire the McLean? Pardon? The McLean. The McLean? Mm -hmm. Well, the, believe it or not, the McLean was kind of a, uh, an afterthought. It, uh, it became available and um, it was going to be scrapped. We had a tug the, uh, Marquette, the tug Marquette that we got rid of and it had no value. But the McLean didn't have a World War II value to it. So we acquired it. Yeah. I think. Um, was the Mc, um, the McLean was an outright donation to the museum, correct? Yes, it was. Because it had been sold privately from the federal government, and it had been released mm -hmm. and then sold into private hands, and so it was a donation then. Um, who did the initial research to tell you about the McLean's history? Uh, the McLean. Mm -hmm. Well, we were we did we were given a complete history of it before we ever decided. You know, it was a board decision to take the McLean on, okay. and, Mc, and McLean was, 
um, McLean was, we knew if we took the McLean on, it would probably stop any future naval ships from being acquired, and they are available from time to time. And the McLean needed an awful lot of work. It was just derelict. And so there was a real question mark of whether we take the McLean on or whether it gets scrapped. And we decided there was just too much history there to scrap, so and that was a, but we could have probably done a lot better and a lot newer and a lot more, you know, a ship without less if we would have held off, but nobody wanted to scrap the McLean and we decided it was worth saving, so it was a kind of a board decision. Well, Bob, on the property there was a wooden Coast Guard boat about 35 feet long that just sat up into the cradles and it started to deteriorate and there were some stories about it had been used to rescue Coast Guard people in some disaster years ago. I don't think it even had a name, did it Peg? No, um, it was, that particular vessel did not rescue the people. Did not. It okay. was similar Okay. In the same style of vessel. Do you have, um, there's a movie out there right now. It's called oh, yeah. Finest Hours. Yeah. Yeah. And that vessel that Frank is referring to, the small Coast Guard cutter, that the small the small ship that was there, the small Coast Guard um, rescue vessel that was there, um, the Liberty ship is what it was called. Um, a similar one was used to make a rescue off of the coast of Maine. And they saved quite a few people when a ship broke up right off the coast of Maine. And they saved um, 26 people on that ship in a raging storm. When the Disney company was looking to make this movie, they reached out to the Lighthouse Conservancy. And the Lighthouse Conservancy tried to find a vessel that was of similar nature, and ours was. And since that ship that we got from Grand Haven you know, just a transfer, um, was just rotting and deteriorating. We knew we didn't have the $70,000 to repair her the way she should have been repaired. We transferred her for the sale of a dollar to the Lighthouse Conservancy. The Disney Corporation then paid the $70,000 to have her repaired, and they used her um, not in the actual movie, but as the, um, on the soundstage. And then they used something else in the in the filming in the water, um, and now she's on display at a lighthouse outside of Maine. And that movie just came out. It's brand new. It came out February, and it just hit the DVD market just a little while ago. It's called Finest Hours. But the ship that you see in that is actually the ship that came from Grand Haven, uh. the Liberty ship. And so um, that's I didn't it. Know that, okay. I told you, I'm a fountain of useless knowledge. <laughs> oh my <laughs> gosh, that's something I didn't know. Yeah, so that that is where that one went to, and that's what we did. This, this is the fellow who hauled it out east and had it completely renovated. Yes. So he must have known Disney was going to be using this and putting Trust it together. Trust me, he knew more than he was letting Yes, go. I'm sure. I we, were, that. we were happy because we knew it, it had dry yeah. rot, yeah. and we had yeah. no money to be able to properly yeah. restore it. And um, so... We did the best that we could. We had it preserved. Even though we couldn't do the preservation on it, they did the preservation on it. And the Disney company actually did the preservation. Well, you know, you get into the preserving these ships, and all of a sudden, they start out as a small project, and then, boom, you're into something you... Well, and especially once the vessel leaves military hands, and when at least when it's under military control, you know that they're following proper procedure. And we know for a fact that people made repairs to the Silver Sides over the course of its lifetime that were not exactly code. And they did things in order to be able to make her open to the public. And so there's, there's a lot of things that need to be returned to, you know, the, the argument is historic versus functional. And trying to keep her as functional as possible is while maintaining historic integrity. But... Um, and I'm sure you guys ran into a lot of those problems on the Silver Sides when you got her, because I'm sure that not everything was up to naval no, code sure when you got wasn't. her. What was one of the funniest things that you found on the ship that was not up to naval code? Oh, I don't know. I guess the asbestos inside the ship was, you know, not anywhere 
It was, it was a problem. Okay, I'm thinking of the dive alarm in the sub right now. Whomever made the dive alarm work, it is um, back in the 1980s, so maybe it was your crew. The amount of technology that they needed to do to replicate the sound of the dive alarms was utterly amazing. We look at it today with this little tiny chip, you can do everything. At that point when they put that in to replicate the sound, they were using huge equipment and speakers and recording devices. And so I'm sure you guys ran into a lot of problems like that when you got the sub. And so what were some of the other little funny things that you found in the sub when you got her here? Did you find any funny items that you wondered about on the sub when you brought her to, to Muskegon? Oh gosh, I don't know. I, didn't, I have to think about that. There's so many things that, you know, it seems like every time you turn around there's a new problem. <laughs> <laughs> but they're always overcome and we were so fortunate in having um, people, you know, like Tom Keenan. Believe it or not, he was silent, but when you called him, his word was bond. And, you know, all you'd say, well, I run this by Tom Keenan, he can, and right away all hands are shake. And so it was the kind of thing you use, and, mm -hmm. and um, you kind of use people to some extent, but again, the satisfaction of having it, I know it's just a warm feeling when you, when I spent, you know, like 20 years, and I finally said, you know, it's time, I've had my day, it's time I walk away from this, and I did. Uh, I said, I'll always have it in warm part of my heart, but I spent 20 years on that. Mm -hmm. Who were some of your initial um, big volunteers? Like, I know that a gentleman that's been around for a very long time, he still volunteers with us, Jim Cleveland, and he said that he remembers working with you. Who was that? Jim Cleveland. Jim Cleveland was a big help. Believe me, Jim was a... Jim was a good guy. He, Jim was a big help from day one. And um, he tells fond memories of times he was on the USS Flyer. And he was on the board for quite a uh, few years, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so... I remember the name, but I don't remember the details. Yeah. And Mr. Boshin? Uh, Jerry Boshin was uh, uh, a carryover from Chicago. He was served in the, uh, on the um, submarine of the... Silver Sides were his actual duty. That was his key to fame. <clears throat> Jerry was a, it wasn't was my idea of a, a volunteer. He was there when, when the, whenever there was a photographer and, a, and the camera, right, Jerry was there. But other than that, you know, Jerry was not a, he wasn't a Dick Fried Jager. A lot of your volunteers were there when, when the right isn't there, when it's just work. <laughs> we didn't see Jerry around much in this game. Um, in Chicago, there is a Mr., and I never get his name correct, it's Newston, K-N-U-S-T-O-N. Kustin, Newston, and um, he... Lucan? No, started with a K and an N. K-N-S-U-T-O-N. Um, and he did quite a bit. His wife donated um, he was very active with the Chicago group, and his wife donated so many of the things from Chicago, like the molds for the Buddha and some of the other things that they were doing to raise money there, and the early advertising material from um, this, from Chicago. And did you remember him at all? No. You know, the, uh, there were so many improprieties in Chicago. Unfortunately, they had... They had a lot of wonderful board members, but they had just enough to, uh, they soured the Navy. The mm -hmm. Navy had a real bad taste of Chicago in the, in the submarine, and, <clears throat> and that's what really made it, really, you know, that's what motivated the move to see you, so. Do you remember Mr. Montgomery? Pardon? A Mr. Montgomery from Chicago? Montgomery? Yeah. George, George Montgomery. George Montgomery. Yeah, his, uh, he donated the... Um, the christening vessels. Christening vessels, yeah. 
the, um, the champagne bottles for christening of the silver sides. The christening bottle? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he donated those mm -hmm. to us. Um, and um, so those are some of the people that we're familiar with from the early years. Who were any of your like board members that you remember? Your uh, board members that you first started out with? Uh, Joel Larkin. Uh, of course, Freitag. Um, oh, you mentioned his name just a minute ago. Oh, Cleveland. Pardon? Jim Cleveland. Or, or Jim Jacobson. Cleveland. Or Jacobson. Jacobson. Jacobson and... Uh, was Don Morrell one of Don your... Morrell. Don Morrell. And Roger Whitman? Yeah, Roger Whitman was... You know, we had, like I say, Chicago had some awful good people. But they had enough detractors that just... Unfortunately, mm -hmm. and the detractors uh, made the wrong impression with the Navy. Mm -hmm. And the Navy's the one that... It tipped the scale to bring it to Muskegon, so. That's good. Well, we'll start wrapping it up because we've kept you talking for almost two hours here. Um, and if you think of anything else, we can come back. But oh. for when um, we're putting this together for next year, and we hope you're able to come because we're going to do this for next summer, um, what would you like to tell people about your time at the Silver Sides? Well, how rewarding it was and to see it put together, to see it become a success, and to see it enjoyed by so many people. I think it's kind of, you know, he used to say, I have something to do with that. Maybe not an awful lot, but I, was a, I had a little bit to do with that, so it's kind of a satisfaction of, of knowing that something you did is, is positive. And, and I'm pretty proud of the time I put on the submarine, so. Well, you deserve the credit, you that's for sure. The you really, really do. Yes. Does anyone else have any questions that they can think of off the top of their head? Mm -hmm. If you think of anything, just jot down some notes and well, we'll you know, come I back. I haven't really thought about it. It's been 20 years. Well, now that we've brought it all up to the surface, if you think about anything, just jot down a note or two and we can come back and we can talk more about those kind of things. Oh and yeah, there's so many, like I say, there were so many good people that got involved. And there's people, you know, like, like Cleveland. Mm -hmm. You don't hear a lot about them, but they were behind the scenes doing the work. And uh, uh, you, you can't say enough about them. They, there's just no way they were gonna ever get they had a voice they should give for what they've done, so. Um, I just think I was so fortunate. I was at the right place at the right time, and everything just worked out right, so. Well, thank you on behalf thank of you us. Thank you so very much. But it was a labor mm -hmm. of love. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we can see that. We can see that in your legacy there. And I think it was just such an honor that they named the building after you. Well. It's just such an honor. Every time I walk back to that plaque, mm -hmm. I think about you. And it's so good to see you. It's so good to be able to have this chance to talk oh, to you about I, it. You know, there was so much. A lot of it was, I should say, was selfish because I love doing it. <laughs> I well, it's not hard. work when you love doing it then. It doesn't feel like work. It feels like pleasure when you get to love what you do. But yeah, and if you think of anything else that... I sure will. Yeah. yeah, just jot yourself down a little note and we can come back and we can talk again. And if we have any other questions or things that... Because for the next year, well, yes, pretty much the next year, the next 10 months, I'll be just researching our history from the time that um, she was decommissioned until the present, trying to put our story together of how she got to be here in Muskegon. And so I may have a few more questions for you okay. after I... I may remember a few more names soon. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But just jot them down in a notebook, if you, anything you think of, and then we will... Um, you've got our number, you give us a call, and we'll, uh, we'll come back out and talk some more. Or I may discover something exciting in the newspaper or something like that, because I do have most everything 
I have a stack about yay big of the articles from when she was in Chicago. Oh, and I have three gentlemen that were on her as a reserve vessel up at Great Lakes. And so we'll be compiling a lot of that together too. And so, well, so, you know, uh, you think back about it, um, the things you, you like to do or you, you know, or, were easy to do and you love to do them, but you don't really sit down and say, well, you know, this this was just something I wanted to do. And it, it's selfishness because if you didn't like to do it, you wouldn't have done it. But That's yeah. a good selfish thing. It's a good selfish thing. Yes, so. yes, yes. So. Well, if your, your son ar arranged, we talked to him and uh, if you can write some of these things oh, down and, right. and then give them to him and he can call us mm -hmm. with some of that, then um, sure. So, well, well this I has know been a nice area to have, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Bob. Oh, my pleasure, yes, baby. Thank, you, oh, thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. And I appreciate for all you've done in the past because without you, there would be no oh, submarine in this Keegan. With, I'll tell you, with a lot of love and a lot of. Uh, just love to do it. Yeah.